We are uh, in a series of messages right now called Be the One. Um, Be the one to what, right? That's what we've been learning about. Who is it that God wants us to be? And we've learned many of those things over the, the last few weeks. Uh, we're going to be learning more today and that over the next couple of weeks before we go into a new series of messages. And it's been really cool to, to see the expectations that God has for us and what he desires of us. And today is a really important theme that we're going to be learning about because today we're learning about something that we are to do that affects culture. We are to be the ones who appreciate to appreciate. We are to appreciate people and the role they play in our lives and to be thankful for the people that God has brought into our lives. We can choose to appreciate people by being thankful for who they are, for what they can do, what they've done in the past, and to be grateful for them. Or we can be jealous, right? We can take a totally different path. Instead of appreciation, we can look at them and have very negative feelings about other people. And instead of seeing that we're important to each other for the sake of community and the culture together, we can go the opposite direction and become people who affect culture in a very negative way. You're probably thinking, especially if you're a first-time guest today, why in the world is he talking about this? Does this church have a problem? No, it doesn't, all right? We are going through the book of Acts and learning about the history of the church and and what was happening with the the early Christians. Jesus had died, had been buried, was resurrected, hung out uh, on the earth for a little while, and then ascended into heaven. And then these Christians were left. And these Christians started spreading the message of the gospel with other people and showing God's love to others. In fact, by looking at the history of their life, we can see who they were to see who we are to be. They were the ones who did certain things, so we're to be the ones who do certain things. Well, today we get to a portion of Scripture where we see where there was a problem. And the problem was not everybody was about appreciating others. There were some people who fell for this negativity that comes through a heart of jealousy. There were some significant leaders during the time uh, for God. They were the apostles. They were the disciples who had been following Jesus around, who had this meal that we had just celebrated a moment ago. They had that meal with him, and they were uh, going around and sharing the good news of Jesus, but were doing miracles and other things, and they were drawing crowds because of what they were doing for God. People were just awestruck about what was taking place. Well, that was going on, but there were some other people who saw what was happening, and they responded in a really negative way toward it. So I want to read this portion of the scripture so that you'll see what was happening. It's found in Acts chapter 5. The Bible says this, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. And we see what happened because of this in verse 14. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their numbers. So a, a much larger group began to gather and began to believe in God. We read this further on in verse 16. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all the associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with, what's the next word? Jealousy. They were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Let me tell you a little bit of the story before the scripture picks back up again. They're in jail. At night, an angel of the Lord comes and opens the jail gate. The angel tells them, go back to the center of town or go back to the temple courts and start telling people about this new life that you have with God. So they did that. The next morning, the high priest and his associates and the chief uh, of the guard came and they discovered that these guys were gone. Word got back to the people who were there that they were back down at the temple courts talking again and, and sharing again. So they go down there to get them again. So when they go and find them, they bring them back again to the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group of people, they were like the leaders of the people of Israel, and they wanted to talk to them about what they were doing because they wanted them to stop what they were doing. So this is what they said to them. 
We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. This man's blood is talking about Jesus because they were telling the people that Jesus had died on the cross and it was from the hands of the people of Israel that he had been put on the cross. That they had a role in this, that all of our sins placed him there. But these people were supportive of him being put on the cross. Then Peter and the other other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. So they told him, Don't speak. And they said, We got to obey God. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. So he did this all for you guys. He did it for you. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. I want you to get who was jealous. The people who were jealous of the apostles were the people who had the responsibility to lead the people of Israel to God. It was the high priest. It was his associates, those people who helped him. He had the responsibility to lead people to God and to lead them to live a life like God. That was why he was there. Yet, it wasn't about God anymore. It was about him. That's the problem. We see the reaction of jealousy because it was no longer about leading people to God or to live like God. It was about who he was and the threat that he felt against him because he found his value in the wrong place. So my question for all of us today is, is my life about God or is it about, is it about me? Because jealousy only comes when it's about me. Jealousy and selfishness go hand in hand. So what does it look like? Let's look at some basic things about jealousy. On your outline sheet, we see that jealousy comes when we find our value by comparing ourselves to others. That's what we do. We look at people and we want to be like them or we want to have more than them. Jealousy is a feeling. It's an emotion. It's actually an emotion. It's this thing that wells up with us, and this feeling causes us to have other types of feelings. For example, on your outline sheet, you see this. It's a feeling of resentment. I begin to resent other people because I'm jealous. I begin to resent other people. I resent them because they have something that I want. I resent them because I have another feeling. Actually, it's this. It's a feeling of being envious. They have more money than I have. I want their money. They have more influence than I have. They, have uh, they, they look better than I look. They are more popular than I am. They have abilities that I don't have. I mean, they're really good at doing this, and I want to be that good at doing this, or I want to be better than them at doing this, and we become envious over that. And that envy feeling is something that begins to control us because we feel motivated to get as much are more than everyone who is around us. That becomes the motivation. Our value is found in having as much or more than others. In other words, our value comes in comparisons. Our life is all about comparisons. Our life is one big, fat, hairy competition. It's what it is. It's a huge competition. I'm always striving to be better than others. But that's not where we're supposed to find our value from. Our value isn't from comparison. Our value is in uniqueness. I am valuable because I am uniquely created by God. I wasn't created to be as good or better than others. That's not in the mindset of God. God created me uniquely with the gifts and the abilities that I have on purpose to fulfill a purpose, and that is to help people see him. That is why he created me in uniqueness. So I go from being uniquely created by God and celebrating that God created me in this way to living my life, constantly comparing myself to other people, always striving to be better than other people, and it begins to control our lives. It's all about value. 
fact, that's the next statement on your sheet. It indicates the source of our value. So what do your feelings tell you about what you're valuing? What does how you're feeling tell you about what you are valuing? Is it that I need to get the attention? I need to get what it is that everybody else has. What we know is, whatever it is that values us, whatever these feelings are, especially if they're negative, they begin to control our life and they begin to lead us to behave in certain ways. Fourth thing on your sheet. It's the, fee- it's the fuel behind our actions. I mentioned this uh, many times before. We've talked a lot about emotions around here. And uh, one of the things that we've learned uh, a lot about in the past is uh, that in emotions, that our emotions follow a process that we think and that we feel and that we act. Y'all may remember that. That we think, because of the way we think, we have certain feelings, and then our feelings become the fuel for whatever our actions are. I want you to think about what we think. Our thinking is what we believe in our mind. We believe that life is about being as good or better than others. That's the belief. That's what we think. When we don't live up to that expectation of belief, I begin to feel, have feelings related to not living up to those expectations. I become envious, right? I become resentful toward people. And when I'm envious and resentful toward people, I begin to do things toward other people. In fact, that's the second thing on your outline sheet I want to talk to you about. What does it look like? Jealousy causes us to act out against others. I can either act out against others or I can act in a way that is for others. I'm either coming against or I'm helping out. Jealousy never leads us to to help out. It always causes us to act out against other people. Let's get back into the story because we see this is exactly what happened with these guys. What did they do? They acted out against the apostles. We see what they did. In verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Why? Because they were jealous. Why were they jealous? Well, let's think about that. They were jealous because the apostles had people who were following them. The apostles had people who were listening to them. The apostles had people who were coming to them for help. It's exactly what they wanted. These leaders of Israel that got jealous, they wanted people to follow them. They wanted people to listen to them. They wanted people to come to them for help. That's who they wanted to do. Well, that's not what they were doing. They were getting what they had a desire for in their own hearts. So what is the solution when you're not getting what you want? You got to wipe out the problem, don't you? You got to get rid of the problem. You've got to remove the problem. You have to to ruin whoever is getting in the way of you getting what it is that you want. There are two main behaviors that we all have. This is just so elementary, okay? First thing is this. We use our mouth on your outline sheet. Let's fill this in. We act out through what we say. It doesn't go into a lot of detail about things that they might have been saying about the apostles. We can look at a lot of other scriptures in the Bible that talk about our mouth and how our mouth can start a fire and that it's, it leads us in the wrong direction and we have to be careful about what we say. Why do we say negative things? Well, if we're jealous, we use our mouth to do what I just said. We want to ruin their reputation. We've got to keep them from being successful, so I'm going to say things about them to ruin their reputation. I, I may lie about them. I may gossip about them. Whatever it is, I'm using my words for the wrong purpose. God wants us to use our mouth for the right purpose. And the right purpose is this. It's to be positive and to celebrate other people. To say positive things toward other people, to encourage them, and to celebrate them. To make them feel good about who they are. That's what God wants us to use our mouth for. But unfortunately, we begin to use our mouth, and we're critical with our mouth. And we're hurtful with our mouth complete opposite way in which we're supposed to speak to each other, which says something to me. I need to be thinking about what I'm saying to or about other people. Is what I'm saying about people positive? Is it something that is encouraging and celebrating other people? Or am I constantly critical about other people? Or or am I saying hurtful things to other people? Why would I be doing that? Well, let me think. 
Maybe we're jealous. Maybe that's the problem. We're trying to get rid of the problem so that we can get what we want. Our words are telling us so much about who we really are and what we're valuing in our life. I'm not living to be uniquely created by God. I'm living to be compared. And it begins to control us. So what else do we do? Not only what we say, but what we do, obviously, right? We act through what we do. We begin doing things deliberately to try to harm them, whatever it might be. For them, these guys, they threw them in jail. Maybe that'll shut them up, right? Or for some, maybe it's physical violence. If I'm physically violent against you, I can show my power that I'm stronger than you and I'm better than you are. I show it in that way. Or it's to stand in the way, to do something to keep somebody else from being successful. I don't want them to succeed, so I'm going to do something to keep them from being successful. We see this in a lot of different places. I mentioned that... uh, what we're talking about today is about culture and that we can have a culture of appreciation in a community like a church, or we can have a culture where there's jealousy in a community like a church or like a team, athletic team, or in a business or with any group of people. There can be a culture of appreciation or there can be a culture of jealousy that's happening within that culture. And what happens is, whichever way we go has a determining factor on the success of what it is. I think about in a business world, I, I want to be successful. I want to make sure I get to the higher level. So I'm going to stand in the way of getting, uh, making sure that somebody else doesn't get the promotion. Or I'm going to make sure they get transferred somewhere else. Or I'm going to make sure this. Or I'm going to make sure this. Whatever it is, we're constantly bringing out the negativity about other people instead of wanting the success of the group. That's the other thing that we need to think about right now. When we become jealous, we're no longer concerned about the success of the group. We're only concerned about our own success. You see, what God wants us to do is he wants us to be concerned about the success of of the group, of the kingdom of God, to show God's love to other people so that everybody knows that, he's, that they're loved and that God wants a relationship with them and that God wants them in the kingdom. That's what our job is. In fact, he uniquely created me to fit into the puzzle on the team so that I can make sure that the group does it well. That's what I'm supposed to do. But the moment I get jealous, it no longer becomes about the group It no longer becomes about what we do. It becomes about who I am. I only want you to see who I am. Y'all, we need to lead people to see who he is, right? To see that he is a God of love. Jealousy destroys the culture from being able to lead you as a group, team, whatever, body, to succeed for the kingdom of God because we work against it. What else do we learn? Third thing on your outline sheet, number three. Those who are jealous follow man's life plan and not God's. They went to them and said, hey, stop talking about Jesus. You guys stop sharing this. And their response was in verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must. Everybody say the word must. That was really good. We must do it. In other words, this is what we live for. I've got to do this because this is my calling in my life. This is why I'm here. I want team God to win, right? That's why I'm here. There are two different life plans that we can choose from. The first life plan is man's life plan, right? We rely on my ability or I rely on my ability to succeed. This is typical in what happens uh, in, in our world that many people don't want to rely on other people. They want to be self-sufficient. In fact, they find their value in self-sufficiency. If I need somebody else, for them, it becomes a sign of weakness that I would need someone else. That's man's plight. That's man's issue and man's problem. In fact, you can tell it in man because many times Mankind is constantly trying to hide their weaknesses instead of reveal their weaknesses, right? Isn't that the way it is? We don't want people to know what our weaknesses are. We're constantly trying to cover those things up and lead people to think, I don't need anyone else. This is a life plan. And by the way, 
it doesn't work. Have you figured that out yet? Because we can't deal with everything in life alone. The other life plan is God's life plan. And God's life plan is to rely on God's ability to succeed. So it's not in self-sufficiency. My value instead comes in my being created by God, my being loved by God, and my being in a relationship with a God who can help me. That's where my value comes. From being not in self-sufficiency, again, me on my own. Instead, it's the complete opposite. I'm valued because somebody else created me to be who I am. That person loves me, even though I don't deserve love. And I need a relationship with God because God is somebody that I need to help me deal with these things in life that I can't deal with. That's God's life plan. And God's life plan is not self-sufficiency of hiding my weaknesses. And God's life plan is realizing we are not self-sufficient and we want people to know what our weaknesses are. And the reason why we want people to know what our weaknesses are is because we need help. We need people who help us. This is so really, this is something so cool to me about God. God has abilities that we don't have. He wants to help us in areas of our weakness. This is really sweet. Do you know how he helps us in areas of weakness? He creates other people who are strong in areas of our weakness. And he sends those people who are strong in areas of our weakness to come help us who are weak. That's how he does it. That's God's plan. That's why we are the ultimate team together. Because we realize our weaknesses, which means this. I am strong in areas of somebody else's weakness, so therefore God is going to use me to be able to go and help somebody who is weak to help them in their time of need. I'm a part of God's plan to help other people be successful. Isn't it really cool to think of it that way? Isn't it cool to think of other people being that way? Because when I think of other people that way, it changes how I see people. Now I see people as a source of help that God is providing for me, not as someone who is a threat to me. Did you hear that? I no longer see people that way. I see people as someone that God has provided for me, not as a threat for me. And it changes my whole perspective because now I go from the attitude of jealousy to the attitude, be a great title for a sermon, of appreciation, right? Now I understand why I appreciate. I appreciate because I need help. I appreciate because God has sent people in my life to help me in my areas of weaknesses. I have this sense of appreciation and it changes how I feel. Now before, there were negative feelings. When we appreciate, there are positive feelings. Number four on your outline sheet. Those who appreciate experience positive feelings for others. In jealousy, we have negative feelings. You remember what they were. They were resentment and envy. But in appreciation, we have these feelings. We are grateful. We are grateful to God that he has provided other people who are there who can help those in areas where they are weak. And not only are we grateful that he's provided for them, Look at the next one. We are thankful. We are thankful because he's provided them for us. We're not just grateful that this was his plan to lead people to be strong in people's areas of weakness, but we're thankful because he's doing it specifically for us. That he's sending people in our lives to help us be better. And we are thankful for those people who can be there to be a support for us and to encourage us and to strengthen us because we all need to be strengthened. What does it say to us? It says that we value others. I have a heart of appreciation because I value the people that God has brought into my path. I value the people that God has placed on the team. I value people that God has placed in the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We just said that a moment ago, right? We're the body of Christ. We have different arms and legs and fingers and eyes and ears who do different things. Together, we are the body of Christ who can do something great for others. And we need to value people around us. May this culture be a culture of appreciation. 
and never one of jealousy because someone has a greater influence or greater ability or greater this or greater that or more of this or more of that. One of the things that we can do to make sure that we are people who appreciate is to actually show our appreciation and tell people that we appreciate them. It does two things. One thing is it invests in that person to help them see they have value, that God has placed them in a position and they're making a difference. And they, it just reinforces in them that God has put them where they are for a purpose. Here's the other thing. When we write words or say words of encouragement, of appreciation to other people, it reminds us that we need other people in our lives. And we want to encourage you to do it. I want to encourage you this week to make sure that you thank people in your life who have been instrumental for you to help you in areas of weakness, especially, or in some area of growth. We're doing it. We're making it so easy for y'all. We made these awesome, wonderful, they're fantastic. Y'all, a little thank you cards. We want to give these to you. They're so creative, okay? It's awesome. It looks like this, okay? Did y'all get the creativity? It's thank you. We gave these cards. Y'all, oh, there's more. You can put an address on the back of it. How's that? We did this for you. When you leave today, I want to encourage you to grab one of these cards. We're not paying for postage because we're cheap, okay? So anyway, uh, but send it to someone or send someone an email or a text or say something where people can see and actually read that you're thankful for them. It's going to keep you from having a heart of jealousy. This needs to be a discipline for us. In fact, it ought to be a weekly discipline for us. Who can I thank this week for what they've done for me? Here's a fifth and final thing that we're going to learn. We are to appreciate our role in making a difference. God has put us in a certain place and position for a purpose. That's the next statement. It talks about that role again. We are to be thankful for our role. We need to be thankful that God created us. He wants to use us. He he. he sees value in us. He is grateful for us. I mean, think about that. God is grateful that we're here. He's thankful that we're here because we're people who can be used by him to make a difference. And we need to appreciate the fact that he values us enough that he wants us to be involved in what he's doing. Not only that, we're to be thankful for our role, but we also are to be thankful for our uniqueness. We've already learned this. I need to be thanking God. Instead of me constantly comparing myself to other people and wishing that I had more of an ability in certain areas that other people have or more of whatever, I need to thank God that, God, you created me uniquely in this way and you did it on purpose. You did it for a reason so that you can use me to do something great for God. So instead of us constantly thinking about who we want to be like others, we need to gravitate toward accepting who God created us to be and the person that he created us to be. Here's the final thing, and we'll be done. We're to be thankful for our influence. One of the things that people get so jealous about is how much influence other people have That was the problem with these Sadducees. That was the problem with these religious leaders. They had people, right? The apostles had people who were following them, who were listening to them, who were coming to them for help. They had great influence, and it drove them crazy because they were losing their influence. Our value is not in how much we influence. It's in that we influence. God has placed us in our world He has brought people in our circle, no matter how many people that is, to influence people for the good. And we are to appreciate whoever it is that God has placed in our pathway to be an influence. One of the greatest examples of this, you may have heard this before, but it started with a guy years and years and years ago whose name was Edward Kimball. I have a personal connection with him, by the way. Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher. And he had a group of boys, and they were, they were rambunctious, and they, some of them were far away from God, one of them in particular. This young boy, was he worked at a shoe store, so he went one day to the shoe store to have a conversation with 
with this kid to talk to him about God and about having a relationship with him. And this kid came to know God. He gave his life to God. It was awesome. His name was Dwight L. Moody. Dwight L. Moody became a great evangelist. Some of you have heard of him before. Dwight L. Moody spoke the gospel in two continents, sharing the good news of Jesus. It was amazing. It had such an incredible influence. During one of those meetings that Dwight L. Moody was leading, another man came in. He showed up at the, at the revival meeting. His name was Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman came to know God from the message that he experienced during that revival service. Came to know God and gave his life to God. Well, he wound up being somebody used in the ministry as well. Wilbur became an evangelist, a, a preacher, and he went from place to place to preach the gospel to other people. And then one day, Wilbur Chapman is in a, a tent meeting, and this another kid shows up to his meeting, a professional baseball player. And this professional baseball player was off that day, and he had heard about this revival meeting, this tent meeting thing that was going on, and he wanted to hear what was going on. So he goes, and he shows up, and he hears the good news and gives his life to God. His name is Billy Sunday. Well, Wilbur decides that he's going to take a pastorate in a church. He invited Billy Sunday to come along with him during the revival services before he had made that decision. So when Wilbur decided to go to this church, Billy Sunday decided, well, I'm going to quit baseball and I'm going to become an evangelist myself and I'm going to start preaching the good news to people. So he started preaching the good news to people. One day he's preaching a message in a guy named Mordecai Ham walks in the door. Mordecai Ham hears the message. Mordecai Ham gives his life to Christ. And guess what happens? God uses Mordecai Ham to also be an evangelist who starts sharing the message with other people. And one day, Mordecai Ham is in the South. He's in Charlotte, North Carolina, when this tall, lanky kid with blonde hair walks in who's in high school. Here's the message and is radically transformed by the news that he heard about Jesus. And his name was Billy Graham. Billy Graham hasn't spoken to thousands or millions. I'm not saying this wrong. Billy Graham has literally spoken to billions of people around this world. All because of a guy who was a Sunday school teacher named Edward Kimball. That's not the end of the story. Because in 1979, Billy Graham was speaking at a big event for the Southern Baptist Convention in the Houston Astrodome when a freshman in high school was sitting there with his parents hearing the message. His name was Tim Passmore. And it was that night, it was that night that I went down on the field in the Houston Astrodome to commit my life to being into full-time vocational ministry. I'm grateful for Edward Kimball, a Sunday school teacher who was faithful to reach the small group of boys that were in his influence and look what God did. Y'all, this is a team, right? This is a team. It's amazing because after the last service, one of our senior adults came up to me and he said, Tim, I've got a story too because my mom went to a crusade that Billy Graham did years ago, gave her life to Christ. And it was because of her influence, because of what Billy Graham had spoken into her heart, she gave her life to Jesus and she came back and told her kids. And today there are five of the people that are in our family that are doing ministry around the world because of that influence. Isn't it incredible? Yeah, it's incredible because of, uh, what was his name? Edward Kimball. I appreciate Edward Kimball. And you know what? I am quite sure that Edward Kimball appreciates Billy Graham. Because we are all in this together. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. Are you overcome by jealousy and are living your life comparing yourselves to others? How miserable are you right now? Because I got a feeling you're probably pretty miserable because you were never created for that purpose. You were created to be known by God. 
It may be today that you don't have a personal relationship with God. We've heard so much today, even through uh, observing the Lord's Supper, as, as, as I, w- I shared with you about the reason for Jesus giving his life on the cross. We are all people who are sinful, who are weak. We need help, and we do things wrong. And Jesus died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins so that we don't take the punishment for our own sins. We can't be in the presence of God where, with sin, so it has to be removed. And the way of forgiveness came through Christ. It may be today that you don't have a relationship with Him. I want to encourage you to give your life to Him today. In the pocket in the seat in front of you, there's a, a card, a big white card. It says on the top of it, the journey begins. And on that card, there's a prayer, and it's a prayer of salvation. It's a prayer giving our life to Christ, accepting what Jesus did for us through his death and through his resurrection on the cross. And if you've not given your life to Jesus today, I want to encourage you to pray that prayer of salvation right now. Just you and God to to pray those words of prayer to him, accepting what he's done for you and giving Jesus for you. At the end of our service, back to my right, to your left, there's a At Aerie, there are a couple big banners that says the journey begins back there. We have somebody, some high top tables, some our counselors are there already. We'd love for you just to take that card with you, head back over there and just let them know that you prayed that prayer this morning because we want to celebrate with you, but we want to give you a a brand new Bible if you don't have one. We want to give you a devotional book that will help you grow in your faith over the next 40 days. We just want to encourage you. So that might be you today. We would encourage you to do that. It might be that you're a Christian, but you've really been struggling with this whole jealousy thing and you've been talking critically about people or saying harmful things about people or you've been doing things to hold people back or you just totally messed up on your whole value system. It's not in comparison, right? It's in our uniqueness that God has created us uniquely for Him. I want to encourage all of us today to thank God for the people that he has brought in our life to help us in our area of weakness. But also to thank God that he desires us to be a part of his family. That he loves us and that he believes in us. So I want to encourage you today to pray. It might be that you have some other type of need. It might be that you're going through a relationship issue or some other type of struggle or a big decision that you're needing to make or something else you need prayer for. We have some of our staff down at the front of our worship center right here next to me uh, on the floor level. They would just love to pray for you today. So I want to just invite you to come. Just go up to them to say, I need prayer for whatever it is, and they'd love to pray for you. Or you, maybe you just want to come and kneel at some chairs down here in front of the worship, the, the stage here, wherever. Wherever you are, we encourage you to pray. So let's do it right now. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if God's leading you to come, as we hear this music play, you come. Let's all stand right now. Heads bowed and eyes closed. You come as God leads you. God, you're so good to share with us from your word this morning, just truth. And I pray, God, that we would 
completely get it and understand what plan we're living by, God. I pray that we would be following your plan and not man's. God, I thank you that you created us. God, I thank you that you love us. And God, I thank you that you long for relationship with us. And I pray, God, that we would be people who lead others to discover you. God, that we would be people who were encouraging others to help people in areas of their weakness, to be supporting others. God, not to be judgmental and condemning and lashing out, but God, to be people who help others stand, help them get up, help them be stronger, and to help them to be who you want them to be, to be instruments that are used by you, God, to to show love to others. Help us, God, to pour that into them. I thank you, God, for Edward Kimball. I thank you, God, for my dad. I thank you, God, for my mom. I thank you, God, for the Sunday school teachers that I had growing up in Sunday school that helped me hear truth and to know who it is that I should be. Thank you, God, that you continue to speak into all of our hearts. And may we be people who listen. God, lead us to develop a culture of appreciation as we're thankful to you for the greatest gift of all in Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.